How did identity politics supersede redistributive agendas within the Egyptian opposition? Have Egypt's culture wars strengthened or weakened the authoritarian state? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Mohin Rabbani, and for this episode of Connections, we're delighted to be speaking with Hisham Salam. Hisham Salam is a research scholar at Stanford University Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, where he serves as Associate Director of the Program on Arab Reform and Democracy. He's also a co-editor of Jadaliya, which produces connections. Salam is author of Classless Politics, Islamist Movements, the Left, and Authoritarian Legacies in Egypt, published this year by Columbia University Press, and co-editor of Struggles for Political Change in the Arab World, also out this year from University of Michigan Press. Hisham Salam, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Uh, thank you, Moeen. Uh, thank you for hosting me on here. I'm so delighted at the opportunity to engage with you and uh, your many fans and followers. The pleasure is all mine. Um, Hisham, your book, Classless Politics, which, as I mentioned, has just been published, examines Egypt as a case study in the decline of class-based opposition movements and the rise of identity politics, um, uh, sorry, identity-based politics in an era of growing economic inequality. The decline of redistributive agendas and growing prominence of culture wars amidst escalating economic hardship is a phenomenon that many would find paradoxical. So perhaps you could um, begin by briefly summarizing your thesis in this regard, and then um, also respond to a specific question, which is to what extent um, are the transformation of the Egyptian state and the policy choices of its leaders relevant to our efforts to make sense of these seemingly counterintuitive developments? Uh, thank you for your question, Wayne. Uh... So my, uh, my modest book, Classless Politics, is very much driven by an interest in this phenomena that it calls uh, more identity, less class, uh, or the uh, gradual sidelining of class by identity conflicts in national politics, which, uh, you know, beyond Egypt, this is a trend that uh, we've been observing. Uh, and that has been developing on a global scale. As you know, Maureen, there are so many conversations happening right now, uh, you know, across so many different contexts about why the left and class politics and redistributive uh, coalitions are uh, on the decline and lo losing relevance and why they're ceding ground to uh, right-wing populism and ethno-nationalist movements. And yes, uh, as you observe, this is happening at a moment when uh, social and economic inequalities and disparities are surging. Uh, and you see this pronounced at almost every aspect of, uh, public, of the public sphere. You even see it in the media and cultural production. Every, every other week, there is a brand new show or a brand new movie talking about cl cross-class encounters and how uh, tragically absurd or comically absurd uh, they've become in light of these growing uh, gaps between social classes. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just hit the pause button and go talk, of, go watch uh, Succession and HBO or, or even Real Housewives of, uh, of Dubai, of which I know that you're a big fan, Wayne. Yes, uh, my but, favorite show. <laughs> I know it. Uh, but I think my, uh, the main point here is that we're living in a moment that is, uh, you know, supposed to be uh, the pri political prime time of the left. And yet somehow, uh, we find that uh, organized national politics tends to be dominated by identity conflicts and uh, so-called culture wars with uh, their various and context-specific manifestations. And how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of the gap between the class-based character of social conflicts and the identity-based uh, uh, nature of organized national politics? And as you know, Maureen, uh, scholars have been trying to get at this question for a long time. Uh, except these discussions and debates tend to be dominated by the democratic context of advanced industrial societies in the West and experiences from the global South uh, don't always have a lot of bearing on these debates. And this is exactly where my modest book, Classless Politics, and Egypt's experience more generally uh, can have a little bit of relevant, uh, relevance. Uh, in the particular context of Egypt, of course, I think the question of interest is how did we arrive at a reality in which 
uh, class uh, politics and the left uh, are more often than not sidelined uh, from organized national politics by conflicts over the religious identity of the state, as well as the frequent spats between Islamists, currents, and their adversaries. So this is another way of uh, posing the question of how did Egypt arrive at this reality of more identity less class? And uh, the book's answer uh, in a nutshell, um, you know, is uh, Anwar Sadat's policies towards the Islamist movement in the 1970s, coupled with Gamal Abdel Nasser's policies towards the communist movement in the prior decade. Uh, the book argues that the combination of these two sets of interventions have had a lasting impact on Egyptian politics for decades to come. Uh, and uh, you know, one manifestation of that impact is the chronic salience of conflicts over the religious identity of the state. And that salience, of course, comes uh, to the marginalization and uh, at the expense of class informed politics, especially as it relates to uh, managing the costs of economic liberalization. And the second uh, manifestation of that, um, of that impact are the asymmetries of power between Islamists and leftist currents uh, or uh, the uh, dominance of Islamist currents whenever competitive politics are actually permitted by the state. So what we have here in a nutshell is a story about how uh, previous authoritarian legacies or the legacies of Gamal Abdel Nasser and the rule of Anwar al-Sadat um, uh, has, uh, you know, can help us understand why is it that in more recent times, whenever political openings happen in Egypt, Islamist currents tend to dominate and uh, the left is usually nowhere to be found uh, near organized national politics. Or uh, on a different level, uh, it's also a story about how previous authoritarian legacies have left their mark on, uh, you know, on politics and have shaped the political field in ways that created this implicit bias against class-based demands, a bias that persists even when there's so much uh, socioeconomic discontent and so much discontent uh, with uh, neoliberal economic reform. And, and focusing again specifically on, uh, on the state and its leadership, if, if I understand your thesis correctly, you're saying um, during the era of uh, Abdel Nasser, it was outright uh, suppression of both the communists and of the Muslim Brotherhood. Sadat um, adopted a policy of seeking to um, uh, co-opt and instrumentalize uh, the Islamist movement to weaken the left. And then, if I'm not mistaken, under Mubarak, we have um, kind of a revision of that policy where he um, uh, effectively seeks to um, co-opt or tolerate a domesticated uh, left to keep the Islamist movements weak. Is that an accurate reading? Yes, to some, to, 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 to a great extent, uh, I do think that the political field changes under Hosni Mbarak uh, as a result of uh, the interventions that happened in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, which is the fact that, you know, once you enter into the 1990s, this is the era of the cultural left. Uh, mm -hmm. And by cultural left, I'm talking about the left that is less interested in fighting over redistribution and much more interested in, um, you know, in uh, pushing against and resisting the so-called Islamist threat or the threat that Islamist currents allegedly pose to uh, civil liberties and uh, religious pluralism. And uh, of course, yeah, the rise of that left speaks in part to the transformations of politics that happened uh, over the course of the 1970s and 1980s and the ideological debates that, and conflicts that happened inside the left in the 1980s, which is something that the book talks about quite a bit about, and uh, you know, conflicts and and debates that you know paved the way to the rise of this pro-regime cultural left, um, and obviously, you know, uh, Muslim Brotherhood suffered waves of repression under Hosni Mubarak, waves of repression that didn't necessarily reverse the gains that they uh, that they scored uh, in building their organization in the prior decade. Uh, but obviously, you know, uh, really uh, harsh waves of repression. Uh, that being said, obviously, when you go into the 2000s and then we're talking about the post-2011 context, then we're talking about a context in which the political field that we've inherited from the previous era was very much shaped by these political interventions, by these regime, uh, uh, by the legacies of previous regime survival strategies having to do with 
uh, playing divide and rule between uh, you know the the leftists and the uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood, um, and uh, as well as other political actors as well. Uh, so yeah, so we're really telling a story here about how um, you know how the political field has been, the modern Egyptian political field uh, has been shaped and shaped in a way that is uh, very much uh, pushes out uh, and uh, crowds out uh, demands uh, for redistribution and uh, demands to uh, reorient the process of market transformation in a way that distributes the costs of that transformation in a way that is just and in a way that's fair and distributes these costs um, fairly across different social segments uh, of society. And, and I, I just like to pick up uh, one more aspect given your analysis of, of the left. Would it be fair to say that precisely when um, it's class-based or redistributive agendas seem to have the greatest chance of making political inroads um, that these leftist movements, or many of them at least, of, of, of the leading ones, effectively were playing on the Islamists' um, uh, playing field by focusing more on culture wars and identity politics rather than their traditional socioeconomic agendas. Would that be an accurate reading? Yes, except I think the book, um, you know, it moves a little bit beyond uh, the agency of political actors in the short run. Mm -hmm. And it does take seriously this notion of unintended consequences of decisions that happened in the path and past mm -hmm. and, and takes seriously this question of path dependence and institutional legacies. So uh, yes, so to a certain extent, uh, you are correct that uh, the left in more recent times has been playing on uh, you know, its uh, anti-Islamist credentials and you know, you see this in the context of uh, post-2011 politics, at the Gamma party mm -hmm. uh, that was once pushing against the, the just the first and earliest waves of economic liberalization that happened in, in the, the 1970s. In Fatah in the 1970s, the, you know, economic liberalization project of, uh, of Sadat, which obviously had a really important foreign policy component as well. You know, by 2011, they were allying themselves with the party of Nagib Sawiris, one of Egypt's wealthiest billionaires. Mm -hmm. And uh, that speaks to the reality that, you know, all of these actors were coming together in an alliance because they didn't have much in common except their disdain for uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, but, uh, but at any rate, I mean, I going back to my previous point, uh, sometimes I, I think the book appreciates uh, the long-lasting effects of these institutional legacies, and even when you, and the, with the implication that even when you have political actors who would like to break out of these legacies and would like to actually uh, reorient politics uh, towards other agenda items, the legacies of the past, uh, you know, they do they do get the best out of them. History shapes the present. History absolutely shapes the present, and not just history, but also you know the the um, uh, it's not just that history matters, but also that in order to understand the present moment, we have to we have to look at the evolution of politics over uh, long periods of time. Yeah, um, Hisham, in in your book, Classless Politics, uh, you emphasize that it is a case study of a specific country, Egypt, rather than an attempt to understand a more global phenomenon. You also point out that one aspect that distinguishes your examination of the rise of an identity-based socio-political movement, in this case a Muslim Brotherhood, is that in contrast to similar processes in, for example, Europe, um, the, the case that you study developed in a non-democratic uh, context, and you spoke about this a bit um, earlier in this discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, these caveats notwithstanding, are there particular observations or insights you acquire during your research that are relevant to broader attempts to understand the phenomenon often referred to as populism, whether in other authoritarian states, the Arab world, or more globally? So, um, so my, 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 um, my quick reaction to that is that the book is not... Um, is not necessarily geared towards understanding uh, populism, uh, 
Uh, nor can we understand, I mean, nor can we really characterize the Muslim Brotherhood's experience as populist in the strict right. sense of the word. Yes. But to the issue of broader implications beyond Egypt, uh, I do think the book is telling us an interesting story here, which is that uh, international and domestic pressures for economic liberalization can really incentivize the ruling elites to invoke identity politics. And this is where I find that there is room to build on the Egyptian experience and to contrast it with other comparable experiences from the global south. Mm -hmm. uh, because in Egypt, the book is arguing that in the 1970s, Sadat's decision to empower um, Islamist political currents was very much driven by the leftist opposition that he encountered to his economic liberalization policies. So that means that Sadat's decision to open political space to Islamist currents was specifically aimed at undermining, sidelining, and counterbalancing uh, the regime's leftist opponents during that era of Infitah. His empowering of Islamist currents was his own way of protecting uh, the regime from the popular backlash against his pursuit of economic liberalization and uh, against all the austerity measures that he enacted in the name of, uh, of pulling the state away from the economy. And that's because he knew that the Islamist currents would push against the leftist opposition uh, that, um, that he was encountering. There's a broader story here about how his decision to open political space towards uh, the uh, Islamist currents, um, you know, had uh, uh, implications uh, or important implications, unintended implications, I should say, for the ability of the Muslim Brotherhood to develop as an autonomous political organization uh, in the decades that followed, uh, and um, as, and how that gave the Muslim Brotherhood an edge over leftist currents later on. But to your question about broader implications, I think uh, what the story of Egypt is teaching us is that the pressures uh, for economic liberalization and the need to contain opposition to economic liberalization can push the political elites to um, uh, you know, empower agents of identity politics as a mean of sidelining and containing class-based demands and the left. And then when you, when you zoom out and uh, look at the broader picture, uh, it, you know, you'll find that Egypt's trajectory is really telling us about some kind of uh, latent uh, affinity between economic liberalization and the empowering of Islamist movements at the expense of the left. And that observation, of course, open, opens the door to more comparative work, uh, because once you once you read about the Egypt story, Maureen, you can't help but wonder whether there is some kind of connection here that needs to be uh, unraveled and unpacked between uh, IMF uh, blueprints for neoliberal economic reforms in developing economies and the global surge in identity politics and things like ethnic conflict and religious revivalism. It raises the question, in other words, whether these two phenomena, neoliberalism and um, identity politics. Whether they're organically related. If they're structurally linked in ways that we haven't thought about before. So yeah. it's pushing us to think systematically about how all these international pressures uh, that are pushing, uh, you know, developing economies to adopt uh, economic liberalization policies, whether uh, these pressures have left their mark on how politics evolved uh, in, in these parts of the world, specifically with respect to the salience of identity, uh, identity politics relative uh, to class conflict. If, if we take this point of a structural link that you mentioned and perhaps look more broadly at the region, um, I'm thinking perhaps Morocco, Jordan, to a certain extent, Sudan. Um, would you also consider those uh, relevant case studies for, for the issues you explore with respect to Egypt? So yes, absolutely. I think there are relevant case studies to contrast with mm -hmm. Egypt, not necessarily to impose the Egypt story on them. I think well, what there's I no template. Uh, yeah, there's of course no template, and I think what the um, the meta theoretical point. I don't want to use too much too much jargon here, but the meta theoretical point of departure, uh, you know, in the study is that there are different paths to classless politics. There are different paths to more identity less class. And I think we do have an opportunity here to unravel other paths that uh, you know, other countries have taken while being attentive to the structural links uh, between uh, that surge in identity politics and economic liberalization. And I think bringing in more case studies uh, 
uh, will obviously um, strengthen our understanding of that phenomena, especially the more that we move a little bit away from that Western context. And this is how moving away from the Western context helps, Moeen, because the story uh, in the typical uh, democratic uh, advanced industrial Western countries usually revolves around elections and how uh, you know right-wing populist movements uh, and parties are duping voters. It's a theory of duped voter and and how the voting process uh, you know, is shaped or affected by these various political actors, how uh, xenophobia is being, um, is being awakened by uh, you know, forces of globalization, immigration, uh, you know, and uh, cultural pluralism and how the left is not, or the post-materialist left, uh, if you will, is unable to come up with uh, you know, useful uh, alternatives uh, to the neoliberal economic status quo. Whereas once we start moving into our part of the world, I think the story becomes the question of the political jockeying that ruling elites play, uh, authoritarian survival legacies, uh, legacies of authoritarian survival strategies, uh, and uh, very, very different sets of processes. So I do think, yes, bringing in um, more case studies from uh, from our uh, from the Middle East and elsewhere as well, I think is something that uh, that is needed, and I think it opens the door for a much broader, a much comprehensive research agenda. You know, when I this is so this is uh, this book is based on my uh, PhD dissertation project, and when I first started this project, it was actually supposed to be a multi multi country mm -hmm. study. And um, the Arab uprisings completely degraded my ambitions uh, yeah. at that point. So I, I had to um, focus on I one. Had, I had to, you know, it's face good. the music and be realistic and be pragmatic and focus on one country. But definitely, yes, the comparative aspect is uh, is there and uh, very much driving uh, my interest in the in the Egyptian case. Um, so indeed, turning back uh, to the Egyptian case, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, as you know, has been a central player in contemporary Egypt, whether as, as an opposition uh, movement, tacit ally of the state, or even leading Egypt's parliament and government during Egypt's uh, brief democratic transition after Hosni Mubarak's 2011 ouster from uh, power. To what extent does your observation, more identity, less class, help us understand the Brotherhood's destruction since the military coup of 2013. Does the anecdote that the late Muslim Brotherhood president of Egypt, Mohamed Morsi, appointed General Abdel Fattah Sisi as Minister of Defense, and of course Sisi later overthrew him, because Morsi believed Sisi to be a pious individual, does this have any explanatory relevance in, in this regard? So um, Sisi's rise to the post of Minister of Defense, I think this is a more complicated story. And I'm sure as it recall, is, but you know. As, as, as you recall, Moeen, I did write about this in Anjadaliya and Egypt yeah. Independent back when it happened in August 2012. Wow, I feel really old. That was 10 years ago. Uh, and, and also back when Egypt Independent was uh, very, very different. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the question of um, more contemporary and post-2011 politics, I don't think, you know, the book is not necessarily spelling out a theory about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's decline, but the Muslim Brotherhood's rise to prominence, which is also related to the structural factors that led uh, to the, um, the gridlock uh, in 2013, that led to the uh, military coup in July, and that led to its destruction. Um, so all of these things are linked, but on the question of its rise to prominence, I do think that the book is telling us uh, an interesting story here. And uh, it's telling us that uh, the politics that emerged uh, after January 25th, 2011, and the balance of power between various political forces after 2011 was uh, very much shaped by these previous authoritarian legacies. And that's something that I detail uh, in the final chapter of the book. Uh, but before I expand on, these, uh, on this, since we're talking about the post-2011 context, let me just say that I do think that um, in the immediate aftermath of the January 25th, 2011 revolution, there was a, a temptation uh, for us observers to always get lost in the contemporary moment, in the current moment, and yeah. that vast sense of open-endedness uh, that it evoked. It was very easy to look at that era of Egypt as a clean break from the past, uh, 
and that just to assume that brand new politics were emerging on a fairly uh, clean slate, uh, except, you know, dominant perspectives on that era have uh, been shifting somewhat. And towards that end, the book is providing us here with a story to answer your question uh, about how um, the politics that emerged after January uh, 25th, 2011 were shaped by the uh, previous authoritarian eras and their legacies. And here I'm talking about the Abdel Nasser and Sabat uh, eras and the role in, uh, you know, uh, shaping and, and also establishing to a great extent the asymmetries of power between Islamists and leftist currents um, uh, specifically the dominance of Islamist currents or the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, because one of the biggest things that the book argues is that the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood as a powerful political actor in uh, more recent times uh, has a great deal to do with uh, the 1970s and the mm -hmm. relatively open political environment that it enjoyed for much of the 1970s when it was trying to reconstitute itself after uh, decades of repression under Abdel Nasser and Sadat. And, uh, you know, uh, the book argues that Sadat's lax attitude towards the Muslim Brotherhood, as well as the Islam student movement, um, as a result of uh, the factors that I've mentioned earlier, economic liberalization and fatah and opposition and such, uh, you know, um, the the that open political environment, a relatively open political environment, the book shows was a big factor that mm -hmm. allowed the Muslim Brotherhood's aging leadership to enlist the support and recruit large sectors of the Islam student movement. And as you know, uh, Muin uh, and as our friend Abdullah Al Arian, uh, uh, you know, in uh, his book Answering the Call, uh, you know, as he shows, you know, it was within that partnership that the Muslim Brotherhood's return uh, to politics was made possible. So setting aside all of the details, I think the key point here in the story is autonomy. The autonomy the Muslim Brotherhood was able to secure from the state, despite the regime's effort to co-opt it under its own wing. Uh, you know, uh, the book really details like, you know, if Sadat had it his own way, he would have loved to keep the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamist student movement under his own control inside of the uh, political party or under the security apparatus, but he fails. And that failure had huge implications long lasting implications for the ability of the Muslim Brotherhood to evolve as an autonomous political organization in the decades that followed. The mm -hmm. other part of the story is how these same legacies, authoritarian legacies from the past, shaped uh, the way leftist currents uh, evolved uh, and also contributed to their weakness uh, because the left developed on a path that was much more dependent on the state and didn't enjoy the same type of autonomy that the Muslim Brotherhood enjoyed. And once again, the formative period of the 1970s was very important because much like there was a very uh, strong Islamist political current on university campuses, there was in fact a very vibrant, a very contentious uh, leftist current on university uh, campuses and that could have provided the basis for a strong leftist political organization in Egypt, but that never happens for a number so, of reasons. So let me interrupt you and, and, and put the following to you, given, given this context and history that you've just been elaborating, um, two points. Um, the first is, would it be fair to say that within this historical and political context, the electoral victories of the Muslim Brotherhood after um, uh, the uprising of, uh, of 2011 was a foregone conclusion um, for precisely the reasons You've indicated they had autonomy and, and, and power. The left was weak and marginalized and so on. And second of all, if you agree with that point, what, what does this say about um, democratic transitions? I mean, to simply say that the elections were free and fair is kind of missing a point about an absolutely unlevel playing field. So... Um... A number of points here. I wouldn't say, I mean, I, I think we can account for the role of these types of institutional legacies without having to descend to vulgar determinism. This was bound to fail. This was bound to succeed. I do think that the political field was shaped in a way that gave the Muslim Brotherhood an edge uh, 
and uh, that also, you know, created a set of imbalances, imbalances that, um, you know, uh, didn't set the odds in favor of a successful, uh, quote unquote, transitional uh, framework. Uh, so yeah, these structural factors definitely weighed heavily on, uh, on the transition. Was it bound to fail? Uh, I mean, I don't think we can say that. I do think that there was room for human agency. There was room to push against it. There was room for uh, leadership to actually come to the realization. I mean, we're dealing with reflexive political actors, right? You know, you to come to the realization that we need to make serious compromises because if we just take the political field that we've inherited at face value, then we're not gonna come to a consensus. If we just defer to electoral outcomes uh, and say that you shouldn't have a, I should have a bigger say in writing the constitution, you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't have as, uh, as big of a say, then uh, I think we're taking those legacies for granted. And I think we're creating uh, the room for greater polarization, greater conflict. So, but uh, you know, who is to say that under the right type of leadership, uh, major big compromises could have alleviated some of the legacies of the past. I do think uh, somehow, you know, there was a tendency to talk about that era uh, in complete isolation of what came before it. And once again, it goes back to it, to the legacies of the past, because a lot of people would say, you know, why don't those leftists just like, you know, vacate the streets and leave the leave the Harir Square and go set up their own political party if they just organized in the eight months that preceded the elections, they could have like turned things around and they could have won. And but that I think ignores the legacies of the past. And I because, think that because this... given given your analysis of the past, you're effectively saying that was never a realistic option within in that era and within that time frame. Yes, it limited, yes, exactly. It limited the range of possible options for greater parity in the political field. Mm -hmm. uh, and that limited the prospects for building consensus purely through uh, you know, an electoral process because the, the left side of the of the spectrum is very important, Moraine. I think there's a tendency on our part to just look at the Muslim Brotherhood and forget about the left. And I do think that, you know, part of a big part of what this book is doing is that it's trying to contribute to um, you know, ongoing efforts to bring the left back into our research agenda and to provide some critical insights into uh, how it arrived at the various tragedies that um, it's currently it's currently grappling with and uh, you know again I mean returning to my point earlier I think what happens to the left in the 1970s in the formative period is very important because as I said the opportunities for forming a strong leftist political organization at that point were very limited and limited because of what and here is where the Abdel Nasser part becomes relevant because on, you know, uh, the communist, uh, you know, when you look at 1970s and the options that the left had, uh, one of the major constraints was the fact that the communist parties that existed prior to the 1970s had dissolved themselves mm -hmm. under pressure from Gamal Abdel Nasser, who forced, them, hmm. who forced them to capitulate uh, completely and join, uh, you know, and uh, join the ruling A Arab Socialist Union and many of these parties, leaders and activists, uh, ended up serving inside of the ASU's Vanguard organization or Tanzim al -Tabiri. But the key point here in the story is that Abdel Nasser was able to get out of the communists what Anwar al-Sadat was never able to get out of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is their autonomy. You also have to keep in mind, Maureen, a lot of people will say, well, there were other underground communists that were operating in the 1970s. Why couldn't have done, they done something? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that these underground communist organizations operating in the 1970s and that were courting the student movement and trying to establish a presence uh, you know, uh, on university campuses and elsewhere, they were fairly contained, if not completely crushed by the security apparatus, which at that particular point in time for obvious reasons and for reasons I've also mentioned earlier, was much more focused on communist activism than it was on the Islamist movement. And then you have the establishment left or the left that was allowed to participate in politics, be it the Nasser's left or the Marxist left, uh, all of which just got encapsulated inside of the Gamma party, which to be fair, faced a great deal of repression under the rule of Sadat, but 
uh, beyond that, uh, just continued to operate under a highly unfavorable uh, political and legal framework, a framework that reinforced its dependence on the state and compromised its autonomy and exposed it in the long run to a variety of interventions uh, from the regime. So the point that I'm trying to get at, Maureen, is that Sadat foreclosed the possibility that the left could evolve on a path uh, that's, uh, uh, that's autonomous uh, from the state along the same lines uh, of, uh, you know, Islamist currents or the Muslim Brotherhood. And it is within that divergence that we can understand those contemporary asymmetries of power between the left and uh, the Islamist currents. And, uh, within and it's, those it's a trajectory that continued throughout the Mubarak era, effectively. Throughout the Mubarak era, and then became highly pronounced in 2011, once the political field opens, you know, these legacies then help us understand why is it that the Muslim Brotherhood tended to dominate uh, its opponents. Right. So looking at the post-11 um, uh, period, when Abdel Fattah al-Sisi first seized power in 2013, those who believed he could successfully consolidate his rule, let alone lead Egypt for a further decade, were few and far between. How do you account for his political longevity? You've, I think you know some of the factors we've been discussing help explain it, but you know, is it solely down to repression? Has he established a sufficiently powerful institutional and popular base of support? Have his socioeconomic policies and foreign support played an important role, or is there something we've all been missing? So uh, let me just preface my remarks by saying that uh, I just want to emphasize how incredibly uh, brutal this regime has been in dealing with its political opponents and in using deadly violence and politically motivated prosecutions against political dissidents from across the ideological spectrum. Although I should mention that the Islamist sector has suffered the greatest number of um, you know, uh, of imprisonments and, and deaths as well. There's no question about that. And, uh, you know, so many uh, political dissidents uh, have, uh, you know, there are a host of political dissidents who died uh, behind bars uh, due to inhumane detention conditions. So just to and, interject, uh, Hisham, in, in your acknowledgments, in fact, you mentioned many of these Islamist uh, leaders, and it's often, you know, the late this, the late that, because many of these people have since died in the government's uh, prison during the period we're now discussing. Absolutely, absolutely. Many of them have due to, you know, access to medical care and just criminal negligence on the part mm -hmm. of uh, relevant authorities. And relevant to that, Maureen, as we're speaking right now, uh, there are many political prisoners in Egypt who are suffering from similar conditions and uh, whose health has deteriorated a great deal in the recent past and whose lives right now are in real danger. And that includes, of course, Abdel Menam Abdel Futuh, a strong uh, Egypt- Former presidential leader, candidate. And former presidential candidate and former uh, Muslim Brotherhood leader, mm -hmm. uh, as well as prominent political activist, Ala Abdel Fattah, who has been on uh, over 200 days of a, of a hunger strike. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about, uh, you know, the, uh, factors that helped uh, regime long longevity and 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 uh, persistence. There you have it. I mean, uh, repression is a big part uh, is a big part of the story. And, and if uh, I can just um, uh, interject here, because the repression, which during Sisi's initial years in power, seemed very much focused on crushing the Muslim Brotherhood, and also, of course, um, uh, the jihadi groups operating in the Sana'a Peninsula, seems to have broadened very significantly now. You gave the example of, of Ala Abdel Fattah, another one being, of course, uh, uh, Rami Sha'af, basically mm -hmm. encompassing anyone um, who is seen as a not just a, a um, opposition uh, figure who's seeking to bring down, bring down the government, but anyone who is perceived as even being potentially critical of either the government or any of its policies. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, as I mentioned, the repression has targeted everybody from across the ideological, the ideological spectrum. And, um, 
you know, but also outside of the question of, of political prison, you know, political space uh, in Egypt is also has been completely appropriated under uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Uh, you know, one, um, besides, besides the fact, of course, that uh, elections and uh, political party life are uh, pretty much dominated and monopolized by the state and de facto, there is an important development that happened under the rule of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, which is the fact that uh, nearly all privately owned media outlets were taken over by the security sector through proxy ownership. So the spaces that are available to uh, present alternative points of views are very much, are very limited in Egypt. And let me just give you, uh, you know, let me give you an example. Right now, as we're chatting, uh, the regime is engaged in organizing something that's called the National Dialogue, which is supposed to be uh, you know, um, a long-standing forum that's supposed to invite representatives from the opposition, at least the ones that haven't been jailed or went into exile or been forced uh, to exile, in order to have a conversation about possible visions for political and economic reform. Setting aside, uh, you know, the merits of that dialogue, and this could be, you know, the this is a long conversation, of course, but setting aside the merits of it and setting aside the fact that it's a heavily, heavily produced, just like a really, really bad like reality television, not the high end production stuff that you get on ABC, like the really kind of like trashy reality television, low production stuff that you get on, 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 on TLC. Without getting too polemic, my point here is that uh, the very existence of that national dialogue is a testament to the idea that you can't have a free conversation uh, about the future of this country outside of the purview of the state. You have to show up at a convention center uh, under the auspices of the regime to talk about political reform and economic public policy. So the political spaces in Egypt are heavily contained, heavily limited, heavily regulated, and I should say heavily produced. And um, you know, this has to do with the fact that the security interests that are ruling over the country you know, are convinced that opening political space, even to the most limited degree, is dangerous and are convinced that this is exactly what led to Mubarak's demise in 2011, that opening of political space and political liberalization, uh, or at least as limited as it was actually during that period. The but this broke. is exactly, exactly. And this is exactly the encore that they've been trying to preempt. But going back to your point on regime persistence, so repression is a big part of it. The support uh, that the um, regime has been able to receive from its Gulf patrons, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates uh, is also an important part of the story when we're talking about regime persistence, as well as, of course, the complicity of the United States and EU countries. But another important part of the story, Maureen, I think, is Sisi's ability to make the military happy and military institutions happy through the distribution of uh, patronage and by maintaining and protecting and also propping up their pre-existing privileges. And there's also something to be said about the success that CC's had in uh, asserting control over key parts of the security sector. Uh, many analysts note that CC has been able to use um, you know, periodic reshuffles to install political loyalists in positions of influence inside of military and intelligence bodies. And I think this is something that's very important. And finally, I think we also need to consider any conversation about regime persistence. I think we need to consider 2018 as an important turning point in the life of the Sisi regime, because this is the year, if you recall, Maureen, when uh, a lot of political and economic interests that were once tied to the Mubarak regime began uh, showing signs that they're uh, interested in throwing their support behind presidential hopefuls like former army chief of staff Sami Anan and uh, former Air Force general and, um, and uh, Mubarak's last prime minister, Ahmed Shafi. Once, once that became clear, not only did the regime move to repress these candidates and their campaigns and their associates uh, and neutralize them in a variety of different ways or neutralize their political activities in a variety of different ways, but the regime moved pretty quickly to also co-opt a lot of elements that were associated with the former Mubarak regime. And this is exactly, exactly the point when uh, uh, Mustaq al-Watan or a nation's 
uh, future party, for lack of a better term, the acting ruling party, because it's not officially the ruling party, but it's the acting uh, ruling party, this is exactly the point when it becomes padded with so many figures associated with the Mubarak regime and the former National Democratic Party. So there is something to be said about the ability of this regime to also keep some of its opponent, uh, some of its rivals close, uh, or at least close enough to be able to contain them and control them and force them to commit to the political status quo. Um, Hishab Saddam's classless politics is out uh, from Columbia University Press. It's a fantastic read that's very highly recommended. Hisham, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and insights with Connections. Thank you for having me on here, Moin. You got it. <laughs>